just showing up waiting for the talk. Um, today, you're not going to see any pictures of plants, and I want to explain why. Um, this is still information that we're um, developing as a drug discovery initiative in, in collaboration with communities, so to protect both the communities and the um, university IP interest. Uh, I can't reveal what the plant is, but I will tell you a lot about the science, and it's very exciting, um, at least to me, uh, what we're finding so far. So I wanted to start off by first thanking a number of different people. This is a project that's really evolved over a span of more than 10 years. Um, and so there's a long list of people that have helped in different ways. This is part of my lab team. I currently have six undergrads uh, working away this summer on um, this and some other projects. And this is funded through um, various uh, sources in the past. Um, the, the original discoveries are funded by um, NCAM and again currently by MCAM. That's the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine in the US. So um, this is the problem that I'm working on. We're looking at uh, natural products that can help deal with these kinds of issues. These are all examples of infectious disease caused by, um, or the, the pathogenesis caused by Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus aureus can affect the skin in, in, in different ways depending on the strain, the kind of virulence of the um, particular organism. Um, what we're working on in this project is really more toxin-mediated disease. So toxins are excreted by these bacteria as a way for them to capture more nutrients from the host. So as you can imagine, they're releasing toxins, this degrades the tissue and creates more food for them. Toxins also serve the purpose of fighting off the, the um, immune response. So some of these can actually go and burst uh, neutrophils and other white blood cells that would normally um, be fighting them. So this is what we're working against. Um, I just want to point here's a, a toxin disease, just in different types of dermatitis. Scalded skin syndrome in, in infants is, a, is also a toxin mediated disease. This is a diabetic foot wound. This is both biofilm and toxin mediated. Um, and again, this is the cause of uh, many amputations for um, diabetics because you just cannot get rid of these infections. So skin disease is a huge, uh, places a huge burden on the US healthcare system. Now this is an older figure, um, so of course this number is much higher today. Um, but we're talking about you know, billions and millions of dollars that, um, that um, result um, from this problem. Around 76% of the skin and soft tissue infections that are treated in um, uh, emergency rooms in the U.S. are caused by Staphylococcus aureus, and a large percent of these are MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now, this is my uh, approach to trying to find new solutions for this problem. So I titled this talk as the next generation of anti-infectives. The reason I call it the next generation is that more and more scientists are talking about moving away from your traditional um, anti-growth uh, or um, uh, killing antibiotics. So we're talking about growth inhibition or cycle effects, and I'm moving away from that. Instead, we're looking at things that can specifically target some of these pathogenesis processes. So are we able to turn off that biofilm formation? If you reflect back on the picture of the infected foot wound, that's uh, remains infected because of a slimy coating that the bacteria produce called a biofilm. So what would happen if we can turn that off? Or what about the toxins? If we can turn off those toxins, the bacteria, is, you're basically limiting their ability to cause damage. So over a period of many years, as I said, starting, starting with my dissertation work, I've done extensive field work in the Mediterranean and looked at um, hundreds of medicinal plants creating different extracts, both in the traditional manner that they're prepared and also in organic solvents. And then I screened them across um, multiple assays. So today again, we're focusing on quorum sensing, which is what controls the production of these toxins. And I'll explain more what that means, um, what quorum sensing is. In our current work, we're working in these stages, looking at bioassay-guided fractionation of these um, constituents and then isolation of the active principles. So this is the quorum sensing system in Staphylococcus aureus. Um, I know it looks a little bit complex, but there are a few basic things that you should know. 
First is, if this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell, these are autoinducing peptides that get released into the environment uh, where the cells live. It's these signals that tells the bacteria in this um, population when to turn on the toxin production. So again, we're trying to turn this system off. How can we switch off their ability to, 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 to produce these damaging toxins? Quorum sensing occurs when you reach a certain quota of these peptides in the environment. Now, if you notice in the first page, I'm collaborating with the University of Iowa with um, Dr. Alex Forswell, and his specialty is actually in um, uh, staphylococcal quorum sensing, and he is able in his lab to create different um, luminescent and fluorescent tags for these different stages of the process. So in addition to finding out which of these compounds are turning off the system in general, we're doing mechanistic studies to see exactly where in this um, system it's working. Now, basically the way that this works is you have promoters down here, RNA3, which the downstream products are some of your toxins like delta toxin, alpha toxin, we can screen for those. And basically again, it, the system it promotes production of the AIPs, which then get recognized when they reach a certain threshold or a quorum. Now the original discovery was based on delta toxin production um, and the ability of this uh, large uh, uh, panel of extracts to diminish the ability to produce delta toxin. Now luckily for me I found a high throughput um, HPLC assay that you could actually inject the supernatant of the bacteria straight onto the column, which is very handy when you're doing um, fast screening. And basically it comes off in two peaks. So you have uh, deformulated and formulated delta toxin. So in this way, I was able to identify some of the lead candidates um, that we had that were actually impacting this quorum sensing system. Also importantly, I looked for those that were not inhibiting growth. So I'm not interested in extracts that inhibit bacterial growth. Instead, I'm focusing on those that specifically tweak these um, small systems. And here you can see this dose response that indeed as you increase the concentration, this is a crude extract, by the way, of the plant, that you are able to um, decrease the production of um, these two peaks or of delta toxin. Now, since that original study, this was an ethanolic extract of the plant. We um, collaborated again with Iowa, and they ran some additional studies on this specific system. So the accessory gene regulator system, or the form sensing system for Staphylococcus aureus, there are actually four known types that we have. So it was very important that not only we test it in one type, but it also works across a different variety of strains and specific sensing types. And indeed, this particular extract did. So that was very exciting, and it does so in a dose-dependent um, uh, uh, manner. Um, it also works in this strain known as USA 300, or it's actually a, um, a, a very important type of um, Staphylococcus aureus. This is the type of isolate that's responsible for infecting healthy people. So these are people in the, uh, that are uh, athletes, like high school football players, that have uh, contact with fomites or things that rub against their skin, get small abrasions. Then you have healthy teenagers that have horrific staph infections. So this is a hypervirulent strain. <coughs> now for the phytochemical approach, we started off again uh, using ethanol as our, as our original extractant and we switched to methanol. Um, there was no change in activity of the crude and methanol. And we just did simple partitioning experiments. Again, also always going back and screening the bioassays. And at this stage, we're working on the ethyl acetate partition <coughs> and um, testing uh, uh, different fractions created through se semi preparative HPLC. <coughs> This is what the LC looks like for the semi prep. So there are a lot of compounds in there, and we're basically taking off um, uh, fractions every minute. So even in every minute fraction, there are, there are several compounds. So again, it's a step-by-step -step process of, of teasing apart things as we go. Now this is where things get exciting. We had some mixed results initially as we were studying this, where we had some parts of the extract that were showing growth inhibition, which of course interfered with our ability to detect its ability to turn off this quorum sensing system. 
But with the fractions that we've created, we've been able to isolate those that actually inhibit growth. So this is the OD600. It's just an optical density reading that shows um, impact on growth. And over here, you have a luminescent reading for one of those um, tagged portions of the quorum sensing system. So of course, whenever you have um, growth inhibition, you're going to have some um, inhibition of the system. What I'm really excited about are these, this particular cluster of fractions. As you can see, they're not inhibiting growth. They're, most of them are within one to two standard deviations of the control. And however, they are specifically targeting the quorum sensing system. So this is where we're at right now. We're running analytical studies on these individual fractions and retesting them in our, in our um, uh, models. And this is where um, these come from. Of course, there's uh, many other wavelengths you can look at as well. So the summary of activity that we have so far is that we've got uh, the crude extract worked. It also has been non-toxic to mammalian cells. It interrupts quorum sensing in uh, all known four types of the accessory gene regulator system. We've done this with different tiers of assays, so not only looking at downstream products, but also specifically looking at different um, uh, uh, promoters within the system. It also uh, blocks, we know, uh, toxin production in several things. And most importantly, we've been able to separate those compounds that are interfering with our data that actually inhibit growth from those that are specifically targeting the system. So our next step will be, again, <clears throat> running more assays on these, trying to isolate, identify those that are specifically um, targeting the system, doing more mechanistic studies um, to see where in the system they're working, and then moving towards animal models where we would basically create skin infections and then treat them with these compounds. So the end of my, um, my talk slightly, I've really been trying to put out this message to those of us in natural products research that we have to start thinking more outside of the box. I think the literature is still inundated with a lot of papers just reporting MICs and MBCs. And um, I think we have to move beyond that because a lot of the medicinal plants used for infectious disease have kind of been discounted. If they don't have inhibitory activity, they don't kill bacteria, say, well, it must be placebo, or it's just not really a valid traditional therapy. And I think the problem is, is that we're not asking the correct questions. Um, are we thinking about this therapy in other ways? Uh, is it actually improving the immune response? Is it targeting some other specific process that bacteria undergo that can maybe not kill the bacteria, but again, diminish its ability to cause a lot of harm? So if you're able to turn off those toxins, you're not going to get this horrific um, a degradation of the tissue, right? Um, and the same goes for biofilms. Are we able to use these in some way, perhaps, in the future as antibiotic adjuvants? So I don't necessarily see quorum sensing inhibitors like this as a standalone therapy, but instead as something that could be combined with the existing lines of antibiotics to help them work more efficiently um, by basically giving the body um, and the immune response more time to respond to the infection and also the antibiotics to clear out the infection. Um, so that's all I have for now. I know there may be some questions. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering, I can see mechanistically, but it's interesting when it's a core inhibitor that doesn't cut down the growth uh, of bacteria. But as far as the medicinal value goes, having both would seem to be an advantage. Well, it depends on which way you think about it. If you're in, there's a lot of debate right now on whether anti-pathogenesis drugs would be <coughs> subject to the same kind of resistance pressures that things are, right? So the idea is that maybe these work better by avoiding placing that same kind of strong selective pressure. But on the other hand, it also argues for the fact that maybe whole natural product extracts that have a number of different constituents some of these, as you saw, inhibit growth. Others inhibit quorum sensing when they're all mixed together. Maybe that's why this plant works better. So there's a lot of debate in this arena. So that could be tested? Yes. Yes, we can do resistance studies on these eventually. So right now, our goal is to get you know, the IDs of some of these compounds first, and then go back and do more. Yes, Ian. Oh, this is a tough subject. Firstly, 
I'm still struggling to understand quite why the most virulent strains don't wipe out whole populations, but clearly there's some limit. But the other thing is, things that didn't happen in my day, these plasmids, plasmids that confer pathogenicity, whether they are part of the problem that whatever you've got can be enhanced in its virulence, in its pathogenicity, by incorporating a pathogenic plasmid into its system. So, yeah, this is one of the reasons why um, you should always finish antibiotic therapy, <laughs> so you wipe out any of the susceptible um, parts of, uh, in, the, in the population. But, yes, this microbial pathogenesis contributes to a lot of the resistance problems. So, for example, biofilms. Mm. Biofilms cause something known as intrinsic resistance. So it's not uh, due to any genetic cassette in the bacteria, it's actually a physical barrier that they put up. It's basically like a slime wall. Yeah. They coat themselves in and you can hit it with huge doses of antibiotics and they just don't penetrate and you can't clear it. I've actually had a recurrent case of uh, rhinosinusitis, which is biofilm mediated, ironically, and I've had a really hard time getting rid of it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people do suffer from chronic um, infections like that is because you just can't clear it because it's a protective layer. Um, but that mucus layer is your own mechanism for defending against infection there, within your epithelium. There is mucus that you epithelium. produce, but there's also a, a polysaccharide matrix that the bacteria produce okay. that prevent uh, your immune response from, from arriving at the infection site. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of potential in natural products research, as we heard yesterday <coughs> In the, um, the the talk on um, drug discovery, um, is it Sue Min, Min, is that her name? Um, she was talking about how the pendulum kind of swings back and forth. We've been in this era of combinatorial chemistry that man knows best. We can create the best drugs, but I think that we're finding that's not true, and uh, that nature really is the best chemist. And so now we've hopefully we'll have more efforts uh, placed into this room. Thank you.